but basically this is the uh, the uh, uh, moment when uh, everything was uh, was discovered. The answers began to come out because for about uh, well ever since I decided to be an artist, which was uh, about a year after college, I wondered what art was. I didn't study art in college, and so I uh, set out on my own to find out what art was about. And I tried all kinds of different directions, and it was not until uh, uh, 19, the end of 1959 and uh, beginning of 1960 when uh, I learned what art uh, really should be about. Now you're going to ask me, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't put it into words. I put it into works. <laughs> so I can explain a few of them. <laughs> then I rely on people like uh, uh, the uh, wonderful writers who contributed to our book to explain what I'm doing. <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> Is that an answer? <laughs> so uh, it, it, uh, it turned out that, uh, as I saw it, uh, uh, art was uh, the reaction of a, of a, uh, of a mind that is to say mine, uh, <laughs> to uh, my surroundings. And uh, this reaction was not just with the eyes and uh, with the fingers or with the ears. It was also with the mind and the imagination and the emotions and uh, problems, certainly, which uh, distorted uh, answers. But it was a personal a personal activity, at least that's the way it seemed to me. And so uh, what my art uh, amounts to really is a is my visiting different places in the world and reacting uh, as a result uh, differently. Uh, that first example of that, of course, was the street, because I came to New York under circumstances uh, that uh, made me have to live on the Lower East Side in a apartment that, uh, well, in those days, apartments were cheaper, but uh, it was, I didn't have very much money, so I uh, lived a, a, a sort of, uh, you might call it a semi-poor existence, and uh, that made me uh, uh, realize that uh, art could be made out of things that didn't cost any money, such as the things I found on the street, and cardboard, and wood, and almost anything, in fact. So uh, I, uh, uh, that was one of my first lessons, and I started to make then something out of the surroundings, which uh, became a sign of the surroundings. And uh, that first one was the street. Uh, well, there was also a color range in the street. Uh, the colors of the street were uh, the browns of uh, cardboard and the grays of uh, pavement stones. And uh, so it was in a gray area, a gray-brown area. When, uh, when I uh, had, uh, exhausted the, the street subjects, there always comes a feeling when, that you've done enough, that you've said, uh, you got the point across, and then you look for something else. And uh, the way I could express it is that instead of looking down at my feet walking on the street, I looked sideways into the stores that were alongside the street. And uh, this brought an entirely different uh, uh, concept to, to, to the approach. It, mainly it involved color. And uh, the, the colors became uh, very, very strong. I used, uh, I went to the hardware store and I bought enamels. And in those days, enamels were extremely strong colored and they were very lasting because they contained lead and they don't contain it anymore. But in those days, 
the colors were very, very powerful. And uh, I bought six colors, and I decided I would use only those six colors, that I would not mix them. I would just wait until one dried and then put something on top of it. These are rules, rules I would make, my own rules. Uh, and uh, so that was the beginning of the, the so-called store period. And essentially what it was, was to put color into space, to make color tangible, so you, see you could feel the color. Uh, because my disposition really is to the tactile. I see things, but if I see things in the round and I want to make them in the round, I want to be able to touch them and, and stroke them and, and go around them and so on. So that, that's what the store became. It became a color in space. And it led uh, to my renting a store, which was really my studio, and uh, uh, exhibiting the, the works in the window as if they were in a, in a real store. I don't think anyone was taken in by this. <laughs> and very few of the neighbors dared to come in. <laughs> but uh, it was a, uh, uh, well, it was work intended to be a work of art and, uh, and not really a story. Well, there's a, uh, there's a literary element to the work. Uh, I once wanted to be a writer and uh, uh, so I st studied English literature and, and other uh, languages of literature, and I wanted to, uh, to be a writer. So that element of, of, uh, of writing was in the work as well. And uh, the Reagan uh, story is really a kind of uh, uh, a crazy uh, 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 addition to everything. Um, the uh, we wanted to. Uh, there was, I wasn't alone at this point. There were other artists who were who were coming along, and uh, we did in a number of things that were similar. And I I visualized a group of us getting together and starting a, a gallery. And as you said, Reagan was the name I chose. And uh, then I made up a lot of uh, uh, remarks about Reagan. Like uh, when Reagan shoots, no one dies, <laughs> and uh, annihilate, illuminate, things of that sort. And uh, I pretended to be a little crazy, you know, saying these things to people, and uh, that helps, you know. <laughs> it uh, it, it uh, was a literary component, and uh, at the time. Uh, just before before I began to do the street, I, I really had been writing uh, quite a lot of what I call poetry, and uh, that that for, Reagan really was on that course, mm. and eventually Reagan sort of worked itself out of the the pieces, and uh, but it it had a strong period in the early 60s, and I would write all kinds of things about Reagan. Uh, uh, what it uh, meant and what it said. Uh, and in a way, it was a kind of uh, manifesto, but crazed, a little crazed, you know, <laughs> uh, because uh, all of the work at that time was very intense, and uh, being crazy was not thought wrong, you know, it was thought created. <laughs> a lot had been done in New York, and a lot of artists had emerged, and uh, it was an enormously creative time. Uh, but in New York, things don't last very long. It's a city of transients, and, and uh, things catch up to you. Uh, too much publicity, uh, you know, commercial things, and so on. And I, I felt uh, in the end of uh, 62 as if I wanted to go to a new place, a fresh place. And uh, I think it was Jim Rosenquist who told me, you ought to go out to... Los Angeles, now that's a crazy place. <laughs> Nobody's been out there. <laughs> so um, I think Andy Warhol was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I arrived about the same time that he did, and both of us were visiting Los Angeles for the first time. And indeed, it was a different place. Los Angeles uh, had its own identity, 
And uh, the artists there had not gone over the mountains and come east or anything. They had developed their own, their own way of, of art. And they were very nice people. I became friends with all of them. And uh, uh, I did an exhibition there uh, with uh, Virginia Dwan, who had a gallery there. And uh, I had a whole new, uh, developed a whole new uh, a way of looking at the surroundings. Uh, Los Angeles is uh, a place where you get up in the morning, you get into your car, you drive for a long time, and you go to work, and then you drive in your car back home. And the main thing in your life is home, is getting back home. And your, your, uh, your home is, is not uh, more than one story, usually, maybe two or three, but inside it you have a lot of furniture, and it's uh, uh, furniture done, for example, in uh, in uh, leopard uh, vinyl. <laughs> uh, there's one particular place uh, that I went to in, in Malibu, which uh, was a motel, and each room was a different animal. <laughs> you had the zebra room, and you had the leopard room, and the tiger room, and uh, uh, so I got caught up in furniture and in home, and I met a wonderful carpenter. And it was also a moment in time when vinyl was being introduced. That was a totally new material at the time. And the vinyl was very rich and colorful, yeah. and uh, it, could, uh, it could be used to represent the object in a soft version. That is, you looked at the toilet, and the toilet was white, and you got some white vinyl and you sewed it, and then you could get a soft toilet. And this, you could get all kinds of things it, by, by using this vinyl uh, that were soft versions of, of the furniture and your surroundings. So this became kind of an obsession to, uh, uh, to start to make soft works. That had already begun in the performances that had been done in 62. Uh, we had sewed, uh, or uh, my first wife, Patty, had sewed uh, costumes and props so that there was a kind of uh, uh, introduction to sewing a little bit earlier. But the, in Los Angeles, it, it really became the center. Pieces had to be uh, uh, had to go through several stages. The first stage was to select the piece you were going to use and to make a drawing of it, and a detailed drawing. You see some of those in the exhibition, for example, the light switches. And uh, the second stage was to make a three-dimensional version of the drawing, which was usually done in cardboard. And you'll see that, for example, in the, in the plug and, and things in the show. And after that, since it was going to turn soft, uh, you had to have a, a, uh, a pattern. And so uh, it uh, was necessary to uh, make a canvas version because uh, the vinyl, you couldn't, you couldn't make a mistake in vinyl because the hole would always show. But in canvas, you can. You can make a mistake and the hole will close. So that uh, the first thing that Patty would sew would be a, a canvas piece based on the model. And the canvas piece was out of white canvas, of course, and it uh, hanging on the wall, it looked uh, to me like a ghost. <laughs> and that's why I called it the ghost version. But in a, it is a ghost version in the sense that it's the, it's the form beneath the color. And uh, all the adjustments were made in that ghost version, and then the color one was sewn. And sometimes the, the, uh, the ghost version is more interesting than the color version. <laughs> the color version looks a little slick, whereas the canvas has a nice roughness about it. But this was the process in, in making soft uh, sculpture. So uh, later on, when the, the bathroom was translated into the soft bathroom, it was all done this way. So that there are two sets, as you see upstairs, uh, two sets of, of uh, there's, there's a ghost bathroom and there's a, there's a, a, a vinyl bathroom, etc. Well, I think <coughs> in a sense that <coughs> the work was all derived from the surroundings and uh, uh, especially from city surroundings and city goods, uh, it, could, uh, it could be seen as pop art. But uh, 
it's, uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the thinking involved in it and the emotions uh, go beyond that. Uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't really an attempt to make comments on uh, on consumerism or capitalism or whatever you know it was uh, it was an attempt to make art to make form out of the materials around uh, around us and uh, I also think more pop art as uh, being painting uh, work like Roy's Lichtenstein's uh, where he has taken a comic strip and done the variations <coughs> on and so on. Uh, uh, sculpture is, is not exactly like sort of pop art, I think. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easily uh, classified as pop art. But of course, I had to deal with Mickey Mouse. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, whenever you show Mickey Mouse or anything that looks like Mickey Mouse, it suddenly is everywhere. And. Um, uh, that was because I, ca I came to Los Angeles and I had to select something typical of, of the town and there were two things I selected which uh, became the poster for the exhibition and one was a variation on, on Mickey Mouse and the other was a heart because uh, they're concerned with, with the, their gasoline stations have big hearts, things on top of them and so on. There's a lot of uh, visual imagery, three-dimensional visual imagery in the streets of of Los Angeles. So that's, uh, but of course, if you look at that mouse carefully, you'll see that it is a long way from from Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. And it's quite different. And uh, in fact, it breaks down into very abstract uh, combinations of, of, uh, of line. And uh, so it's, it's uh, anyway, I borrowed him. Uh, I borrowed him for a while. And uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the stories of uh, of how Walt Disney started the mouse when he was trying to think of something to draw, and this little mouse jumped up on his table and sat there looking at him. I don't know if the story is true, but and then uh, I also like the the uh, uh, the balloon that was made of the Mickey Mouse uh, and shown every year in uh, New York in the parade of balloons for Thanksgiving. You so, see some photographs upstairs yeah. on the level. Yeah, right. So it's uh, it's part of the scenery, yeah. part of the landscape. Uh, I returned uh, to New York with the exhibition done for uh, in Los Angeles, and uh, that was the uh, uh, in, in the beginning of 1964. And uh, after that, I uh, came on to Europe. I hadn't been in Europe for a long time, and I went to, to the Biennale. I was in the Biennale in Venice, and uh, after that, uh, I did a show in Paris for Iliana Sonnabend using uh, what's called plaster of Paris, and that was all food, Parisian food, which was it was a good moment to have a show because everyone was very angry at the Americans for having taken over the Biennale. Uh, Rauschenberg won the award, and uh, so uh, it gave him something to, to attack. It was very, very good. It was very good when you're attacked. One thing I did was to uh, make forms by, uh, Patty would sew a form, which I had designed, and then I would fill it with plaster, and then I could massage it. And then when the plaster dried, you took off the the uh, uh, canvas. So then you had a, a very interesting form, which was uh, sort of a soft form, but it, it was it was hard. We stayed there for for two or three uh, uh, months and uh, absorbed it, just as the, we had absorbed Los Angeles and, and New York. And indeed, it had a scale. It had a small scale, a very fine scale, and it was done. Uh, uh, it was painted with tempera instead of enamel, which gave it a more, uh, more delicate, delicate uh, color. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, um, this uh, gives you some idea of, of what's going on there. And, and uh, uh, the main thing is that uh, uh, the art is, is, is made as art. But it's all about we're making form, we're making ideas, we're making uh, uh, feelings, and so on. It's, 
the, the art may refer to many other things, but the, the art is in itself the creation. And that's uh, something that I, I keep saying. And even though we call it a hamburger, it's, it's not a hamburger. <laughs> Remember that, yes. <laughs> the uh, late 50s, in, uh, 57, 58, 59, I was, uh, as, as I said, uh, still looking for the, the substance of art, and I was, I was painting in oils, I was painting figures, and I was reading a lot, and, and uh, I was also writing poems, or trying to write poems. And there were two kinds of poems that I wrote. One was... Uh, notations of what I saw on the street. And uh, you put them together one after the other and you get a kind of a, uh, a poetic uh, vision of the street. And the other poems were uh, <coughs> strange, they were, they were somewhat surreal, uh, but in a personal way. And I mixed uh, the uh, sound of a word with the meaning. I sometimes used words that I made up. And uh, so the poems are a uh, little bit hard to understand, even even for me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you want me to, to read a sample? Please. Okay, be a great pleasure. Right. So now, <clears throat> first I read you some selections uh, from the uh, Obser observations, wandering the streets. <coughs> Drops in gray water, tin foil trampled flat on a wet concrete sidewalk. An ice machine grinds ice, metal gull on a metal sky, a smoking cloth, a cripple is sunning his white stump, an old woman with a cane in the rain. A white pigeon flaps his wings on a thin man's linear knee. A woman leans out the window on arms like moons. A tramp drinks from a wax milk container. A dirty gray car's full heavy cheeks an apprehensive glance. Kids find a tramp sleeping in a cardboard box. The box speaks. The old world is yellow, the new cold blue. Silver light spots on the sidewalk, snow flurries, a shiny piece of coal. A door closes, all is magic. A boy with a dog is trying to break something by stamping on it with his foot. A car in parking runs over a bottle. A woman's heels are sunk in the hot tar. Someone knocks at my door, but I'm not there. Shells, radio, knife, cup with pencils, tools, guitar, light bulbs. A thin, horizontal red reflection on the side of a car. Waxy smell of a girl's ear, kissing of hair on the arms. Bland lady alone on a pier. A little girl kisses a cold window. So these are selections that were built into drawings because at that time I was drawing also from the street and so uh, this was typical of the time. Then I put together some poems which are kind of hard to read because uh, it's, it's sort of English, uh, <laughs> it's sort of personal language. <laughs> This is called Panodramra. <laughs> Friends, gull benders, swat beats, whim wafts, calling your apprehension to vermilion snakes issuing from the stage of the ear. What a spat woost from darn down, firing, outbusted perforal muck. <laughs> Bap! 
Saturday flashed to noon. Hand up skirts, red fields its way. List little humdrum duck, each a porridge green. Oh, red Cassidy, oh, smash, oh, smash. Porp. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to worry about translation <laughs> in this kind of poetry. <laughs> but this kind of poetry is intended to be very physical and is to be uh, sort of like art in, in, in making a sound uh, and a combination of, of sounds, you create, again, a three-dimensional thing. And so the uh, uh, I like to look at these as well as read them and do it at the same time. And, uh, if we had, we had, we were thinking of projecting them so you could see what they look like, because the words, the words really become uh, objects in themselves. So those are some examples, and uh, uh, <laughs> I think you get the idea. And this, <laughs> and this led into, uh, well, there were a number of collages done also to illustrate these poems, but this was uh, prior to. Uh, my so-called discovery of art. And I was just groping for things, and uh, I didn't write any poems after after that. After I, after the <coughs> beginning of the '60s, I, I concentrated entirely on uh, on making art. Thank you very much. <laughs>